you pled guilty to attempted second degree murder and were sentenced on September 21st, 2009 to 20 years with the Department of Corrections without the benefit of parole, probation or suspension of sentence. You do have a good time date, which is October 24th, 2027. You're not eligible for parole and you have a full term date, which is January 27, 2028. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Wise. You're muted, Mr. Wise. Mr. London, you've been at the state police barracks. How long have you been at the state police barracks? Uh, a little over seven and a half years, almost eight years. What is your job title at the state police barracks? What do you do? Uh, I'm a dorm orderly right now. What are some of your previous jobs that you've done at the state police barracks? I've only had one other one. I was there for four years. I worked at information technology, which is otherwise called data. And there I was a custodian where I wore a uh, mop and wax floors and clean bathrooms and vacuum. Basically, just uh, uh, orderly. Okay. You know, as I was looking over your file last night, I went over everything. And uh, you've taken some great programs. You went to Allen Correctional Center, Cornerstone University, and also uh, associate's degree in religious education, Botech. Uh, yes, sir. An Ashland student. And uh, also you were training for a forklift operator. Is that correct? Yes, yes, sir. Also, you've done your Cajun Raise 12 Steps and your AA participation in Faith Base. Also, you hundred hours pre-release. Where were you, how long have you, how long have you been incarcerated? Uh, 12, 12, a little over 12 and a half. Well, actually it's been 12 years and 10 months, almost 13 years. On a 20 year sentence, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I want you to just tell the board today in your words and the victim what this, what has happened during this time. Anything you'd like to say to the victim? Anything you'd like to say to the victim at this time? Yeah. Yes, sir. At the time that this in, that that I committed this crime against my ex-wife, she didn't know this because I didn't know this about my own self. I had been going through an identity crisis for a long time. I didn't know what kind of a man I was, what kind of a man I wanted to be. I had no sense of direction. I was just going through life clueless. When, this, when I committed this crime against her, I had no intention on hurting her. I loved her. At that time in my life, she was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I still regret it till this day. And I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, during the time of your incarceration, how many disciplinary actions did you have? Zero, none at all. You've had no disciplinary actions in 12 years? In 12 years, no, sir. I don't have any other question. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Uh, Mr. Roche? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. Mr. London. Yes, sir. I read the official police report. Uh -huh. It was a heinous crime. Yes, sir. How does anyone pour gasoline on an individual and set them on fire? At what, what happened during that time? So I, I know you said you had an identity crisis, but identity crises are not. Right. How do, how do you 
how to burn a house down, pull gas on the individual, and set them on fire. Well, I went outside to smoke. And when I got out there, we had got in an argument pre prior to that. First, I got in an argument with the mother of my children on the phone. And then when I got off the phone, me and my wife started getting into an argument. So my emotions were all over the place. I went outside in the backyard to smoke. And while I was there, I realized I had left my gas can and my weedy outside. I was doing yard work earlier that day. And I don't know this stupid thought came across my mind. Normally when her and I got into an argument, one of us would get in the car and just leave. She had made a statement. She said, during that argument, she said, this time I'm leaving and all of this is gonna be mine. And she was referring to like materialistic items. So when I went in the house with that gas can, I was only threatening to burn up the furniture. I wasn't intending on her catching on fire or myself. She reached out, she didn't leave like I thought she was. She walked up to me and she grabbed the nozzle of the gas can and she started, we started pulling it back and forth towards each other. And gas was flying all over. I reached in my pocket and I grabbed the lighter and I was just gonna, I was just threatening to, to light us, to set us on fire. I flicked it. <laughs> Mr. London, I think that's enough. I really do. I really do. Uh -oh. Would it, would it surprise you to know that your former wife is still emotionally and physically uh, affected by this crime? She's had major surgeries and she's still on multiple medications on a daily basis? I didn't know. I haven't had any contact with her. I didn't know. No, that that particular statement was submitted by the victim, uh, and I want to see if I can get to that one real quick. Uh, but things that you do 13, 14 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, they still have consequences today. And here you ask it for clemency when your victim is still physically and mentally uh, affected by the crime. Yes, sir. Uh, victim, her name was Angelina uh, Paula. Is that correct? Angelia Poulard. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, she's still on five medications for the rest of her life. She no longer goes outside because the sun exposed to her skin, causes blisters. So she's relatively re confined to the house because she cannot go out in the sun. And there's many other physical and mental effects that still affect your victim. So why should I vote for you today to give you clemency so that you can be released and lead a normal life? I've done pretty much everything that I could possibly do. Not just to better myself as a man, but to gain the education and the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to use my experience to be able to help other people so situations like this don't happen in the future with other young men. Okay, now, I went through some things. Now, are you, were you aware that your kids or your children, and it says kids, but it, it should be children. Your children were in the home witness to what you did? Yes, sir. So you endangered your life, the life of your wife, and the life of your children. Yes, I did. Uh, it's very difficult for me to read this information and 
to verify it with you, to uh, give you any consideration. But I will listen and I will be objective and I will make the decision at the very end. I have not made a decision. Yet. Yes, sir. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Uh, Mr. Marabella. Mr. London, uh, you indicated, you said you were having an identity crisis. Explain to me what you mean by that. Well, I guess from early on in life, I didn't have a whole lot of guidance. And the guidance that I did have, those influences were influences that were real negative. I picked up some things early on in life that transitioned with me to the next phase from being a boy to a young man, from a young man to a grown man. And those, what I mean by an identity crisis, what I learned at, the, at that time compared to what I've learned since I've been in prison, going through self-help programs and Bible college were totally contradictory. I learned some things at a young age watching my dad and people who had dysfunctional issues who were self-destructive, who were emotionally unstable. I grew up watching that stuff and that stuff kind of, I, I, I adopted it into my own life unknowingly. I didn't know, I was ignorant to it. I didn't know any better. And that transitioned with me all the way into my adulthood. And it wasn't until I came to prison. And as, as unfortunate as I have to say this, prison helped me, me to grow. It helped me to mature. It taught me th how to how to do things the right way. I mean, and it, it prison actually taught me that I have to be in control of my own emotions. When I was out, and some of the things that I learned in my own community in my own household, I didn't. It was, to lose control was something that was the norm in, in in my household. My dad would do stuff like throw plates and cool phone cards out the wall and things of that sort. So I grew up watching that. That's a learned behavior. I, I learned watching it. And I used that as a way to intimidate other people as I got older. But I really, I promise y'all, I didn't know no better. I thought that was the way to, that was just everyday life for, for me. Right. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. You were 25 years old when this happened. Is that about right? No, sir. I was 35. 35 years old. I'm sorry. I can't add. Okay. You're 35 years old when this happened. Yeah. How much education had you had at that time? High school. What kind of work were you doing, if any? I had a, a detail service where I did automobile detail cleaning. Okay. Now, were you on any kind of medication, prescription medication? Just alcohol. Had you ever had any kind of mental health evaluation or treatment? No, sir, I haven't. You're not suggesting to me that you didn't know the difference between right and wrong, are you? No, I did. Right. Now, let's talk about your alcohol. How, how often were you drinking? Every day, all day. And what were you drinking? Mainly beer. Some Occasionally, maybe once or twice a week, gin. What do you mean occasionally once or twice a weekend? What does that mean? I don't know, once or twice a week. Maybe, what? I mean, you know, whenever, whenever it was available. If I had felt like drinking gin on a Tuesday, I'd stop and buy some gin. and I'd Okay. Drink. You drank beer every day. Every and day. You drank gin once or twice and maybe on the weekend. Yes, sir. And how much beer would you drink every day? Uh, probably... Probably a, a case, a case of 12 ounces. Okay. And when did you start? High school. What have you done to control that drinking? Since I've been incarcerated? At, at any point. What, what, if any, what, if anything, have you done to attempt to control your drinking? Well, I didn't actually attempt to start controlling my drinking until I got to prison. All right, well, let's talk about what you did in prison. Okay, well, first of all, once I got to the 
once I committed this crime and I was laying in my bed in the parish jail and I was asking myself this question, what in the world, how did I get here? And the only thing that kept coming to mind is my, my wife's face. I almost killed her. And I almost killed her due to the fact that, I, for one, I lost control, but I lost control because I had not drank too much. So it was at that point that I had made up my mind. I decided it was no more. I, I didn't want any more. I quit. So as time went on and I got to Allen Correctional Center, that's when I, the first class I got into was Alcoholics Anonymous. And when was that, roughly? 2011. All right. And what did you learn through Alcoholics Anonymous? Well, through my step, through the, through the steps, especially the first step, I had to first admit that I was powerless over alcohol and I didn't have control. When I was out, I thought I had control over it because I was able to do it so easily and so often. And when I got to the third step, I had to realize that I had to turn my life and my will over to the care of God as I understood him because I kept trying to drink and live life normally. Drink and live and function normally. And the two just wasn't going together. It just wasn't working. So I had to learn to turn my life and my will over to God. So what will you do if you get out of prison to be able to control your drinking? Well, what I've learned this ago is kind of associates with my drinking. One of the reasons why I drank so much is because I wasn't in control of my emotions. So me not being in control of my emotions gave me the urge to want to drink more. So what I first, uh, the area that I worked on within myself was emotional stability, taking responsibility for my own emotions. And then now I can start with working on the drinking. I don't have to drink. I didn't need to drink then. I'm in control of my emotions. So it's alcohol is not an option for me. Are you an alcoholic? Yes, sir, I am. Are you going to be able to drink at all when you get out? Am I going to be able to? Right. Mr. Marabella, I don't want to. I understand that. Are you going to be able to stop? Oh, I didn't understand the question. Yes, I've stopped. I, <laughs> there's no more for me. Well, how are you going to be able to stop? You went to alcohol when problems existed. Problems are going to be outside. The Absolutely. world hasn't changed since you've gone to prison. Absolutely. Probably worse. Yes, sir. You may not get a job. You may things are going to go bad. How are you going to avoid drinking back when you get out and find all these problems and issues? Well, since I've been incarcerated, with all due respect, I've been around alcohol in prison. And never once did I had a desire to drink. I quit. That was enough. I had enough. I almost killed somebody. I almost killed my ex-wife over that. If you enough. are an alcoholic, you will desire a drink whenever you're around it. Mm -hmm. You tell me how I know how you can convince me that you aren't going to be drinking anymore when you get out of prison and you're not going to get back into the old habits and do something to someone else that you did to your ex-wife. I hear you saying all of these things. I'm trying to ask you to tell me, to reassure me what tools you're going to use to make sure you don't go back to drinking. I have a lot that, I, that, I've, that I've worked on over this course of time as far as me understanding myself as a man. It's not a whole lot that I have to do to want to stop. Just the simple fact alone that I almost killed somebody just, I mean, that's pretty much all I can say is I, I chose to stop. I made that decision. I chose to. You think it's a choice? 
For me, yes, sir. Did you ever use drugs? Every once in a while, I smoked a little marijuana, but that was it. And when did you smoke marijuana? While you uh, were drinking? Every once in a while. It wasn't that often. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Bell. Uh, Mr. Jones, do you have any questions or comments? You're on mute. No, not, not at this time, no questions. Okay, thank you. Um, let's hear from Ms. Rosanna London. Ma'am, we'd like to hear from you. Can you unmute your microphone for us? There you go. Hi. Yes, Good thank afternoon. you. Good afternoon. Go okay, ahead and well, introduce yourself for the record. Yes, yes ma'am. My name is Rosanna London. I am the mother of Derek London. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with him throughout the years. And I've heard him express to me what he has done and how he feels about it. And even with his life now, what he would like to accomplish more um, in life. I've, I've heard him mention so many times he wished that he could pass on knowledge to his nephews because sometimes they might be headed in the wrong direction and he would like to share some things with them because of what has happened with his life. He feels that he can help other people and he feels that he has grown. I've seen some change in him as well. Um, and I feel that he is strong enough to be able to maybe face some things in, in life. Um, he's not always worked at the facility where he's at. He's worked out in the opening uh, within, you know, around other people as well. So networking like that is a way to help him to get understanding of how things are once you maybe to a, a certain degree how things can be when you're outside and you're no longer in the with as far as a re-entry. Um, I know that we we are looking for resources if he's allowed to come out um, then we would like for him to see him maybe take more classes if needed. If he ever gets to a point where maybe his he has an issue or is starting to become a strong desire to want to drink again that would be a time to maybe indulge or get into some classes if he has to go back to alcohol anonymous to have the strength that he would need that would be a good way to also address that um to, but i've been looking for resources if he's allowed to come out that there are programs that can help with re-entry and with assistance um so we would like to see him be able to um do a re-entry back into society and any other classes that he feels that would be great for him then I feel I would encourage him to do the classes and take classes as well but I think that overall I have seen his growth I have seen his strength um, you know we do talk those long conversations and he's addressed to me now that he's learned that the material things is not all that it's more about having your family, having loved ones, having people that you respect and that respect you. So we are hoping that and believing and praying for another opportunity for him to be able to do better in life and show himself stronger. And myself as well, I'm very sorry about the incident that happened to Miss Angelina. Um, and we just hope the best for her as well that things will continue to go well for her. Thank you, Ms. London. We appreciate you uh, being with us today and sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Poulard, can we hear from you? Yes, if you would introduce yourself and then tell us what you'd like us to know. Um, I'm Angelia Poulard. <laughs> Uh, 
I was, before my incident, I was a go-getter. I worked. I did everything. I took care of Derek. Derek didn't take care of me. I took care of Derek. I worked five days a week. After Derek did what he did to me, it was, couldn't be a go-getter no more. I had kids that looked up to me for everything. I couldn't do it for them no more. Derek took a lot away from me. I now have PTSD for the rest of my life. I have keloids all over my stomach because that's where he set me on fire. I have to deal with this for the rest of my life. My kids deal with this for the rest of their lives. It's like he put a halt in my life. The things I used to do, I don't do no more because of my incident. I hear everything he said. Yes, I do. But why does it take someone to do something so horrible in life? You go to jail, prison, whatever you may call it. Oh, then you want to become a better person because you went to jail. Why does it take jail to change someone? If you, who you say you are, Bible boy, you would be in your Bible prior to jail. Why it takes all that? If I would be, I feel like this. If I wouldn't have made it, if God wouldn't have been by my side, if God wouldn't have brought me through what I went through, he would be a free man because guess why? Angelia couldn't speak for herself, but you know what? There is a guy and he still have me here to speak for me, myself, how I am. It is not good. Some days I feel just like giving up, but why? He bought me this for, and he gonna continue moving me to higher mountains, and that's a promise. Cause God brought me through a lot, a lot. Well, Ms. Poulard, I know that today and, and having to listen and relive through all this has, has been a very emotional roller coaster for you. I do appreciate you, though, participating in the process. And we hear what you're saying. I can't wait because of this. I'm on medication. I can't sleep at night unless I take medication. I was never a woman that was on any kind of medication prior to my incident. Now I'm on three medications in the daytime, two at night for the rest of my life. I try, I try, I try, I try. And I've tried to try not to take my medication. It's hard, it's hard. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I'm going to ask um, Derek, is there something you'd like? Well, let me ask Mr. Swear. Mr. Swear, is there any comments you can add? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Mr. Renata. Uh, again, I'm Riss Swear, Classification State Police Barracks on behalf of uh, Captain Honeycutt. Um, Mr. London has been with us for more than seven years. Um, He's participated in lots of, uh, in several of our self-help programs, uh, as well as some of the programs at other facilities where he came from. He's had no disciplinary write-ups at all during his incarceration. He's got a low Lorna score, and we consider him a, a leader among our population. Uh, he may not be aware of this, but he just recently got a job change. Uh, he is going to be in charge of our laundry effective today. 
So uh, we consider him a leader among our population. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. So Mr. London, is there a, a statement you'd like to make to us? Address your, before we, before we vote, but I want you to address your remarks to us, the board. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say thank you all for allowing me this opportunity. And I really appreciate it. It's been a privilege. I want to say to my, well, to you, I want to apologize sincerely to the victim in my case and the victim's family. I'm really sorry. I didn't know all this was going on. I feel worse now than I did before I came to this hearing. I want to apologize to my mom, my brother, and the rest of my family as well, my children. And I want you to know, mama, none of this was your fault. This was all me. I take responsibility for what I did. You did the best you could bringing me up, okay? And that's all I have. So Mr. London, let me just ask you one thing. You, you, um, when you submitted your application asking for a commutation, what was your expectation? What are you really asking for? For forgiveness and mercy. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, is panel prepared to vote, Mr. Roche? I mean, I'm sorry, this is Mr. Wise, Mr. Wise. Yes, at this time, I'm gonna vote to grant community sentence after serving uh, parole eligibility after serving 15 years. Now, Mr. Roche. One of the reasons, one of the I'm reasons sorry. for my vote, it, one of the reasons for my vote, he, he came in, he was incarcerated, he got in programs, he worked, Hard. He's been in state police very seven years. He's got positive comments from the warden, Swear there. Also, uh, he's not had any right. And I commend you. You went in and done what they asked of you. And I commend you for that. Thank you. And that's my vote. Mr. Roche, you have to unmute. Mr. London, I too commend you on your achievements. Uh, you've been assigned to one of the premier facilities in the state of Louisiana, but my vote is gonna be different because I can't get past the expressed opposition from law enforcement, expressed opposition from the DA's office, uh, expressed opposition from the victim. And most of all, this victim is still mentally physically and um, emotionally affected by this crime on a daily basis. And for those reasons, I, my vote is to deny your request. Yes, sir. Mr. Maravella. Mr. London, uh, you have been very honest with us today, I believe, about expressing who you are and what you've done. Uh, I, I, I'm not so sure about the real facts of the case. I mean, you, you, you seem to underplay them a little bit, but you accept responsibility for them. So I, I, I accept that. Uh, you've indicated you've got a serious alcohol problem. You've conceded you're an alcoholic. Uh, I, I'm not really completely satisfied with your answers about how you're going to stay off of alcohol. Uh, I am impressed with the work you've done. Uh, you had indicated earlier that you were doing AA, still in AA. Of course, that was a year and a half ago when you wrote the application. Are you still going to AA meetings today? Yes, sir, I am. Yes, sir. AA is critically important. I asked you for some tools. You didn't articulate it very well, but you did articulate your belief in the 12-step program and what it's done for you. And I believe that that is extremely important. You have an excellent report from uh, staff there uh, and you've had no write-ups. Uh, 
I sympathize very much with Ms. Poulard and what happened to her. I do believe you are a different person than committed that crime back then. So I'm going to vote with Mr. Wise and recommend that uh, the same, my recommendation is gonna be the same as his. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mirabella. <laughs> Mr. Jones. You have to get him to unmute. <coughs> London, some of all of that was an obstacle you, you talk about before incarceration, before you committed this crime. You know, when you get out, there would be plenty of obstacles, maybe even more. Yes, sir. Do you, um, do you think you have the necessary tools to face those obstacles? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Because the alcohol will be there, available. The drugs will be available. Absolutely. You got people back in the community will be coming at you, trying you, see if you're that same person before incarcerated. Absolutely. Well, you've done a good job of uh, taking advantage of all the programs that DOC has to offer you to we, to, you know, to rehab and try to make you a better person and realize your mistakes. You've done a good job of uh, taking advantage of all of those programs. Um, I'm going to trust in my colleagues here, Mr. Jim, Mr. Marbella. I'm going to vote along with them. Uh, so good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Mm, Mr. London. Yes, ma'am. This is a this is it. This is yours is a difficult case because we sit here and we we hear how uh, your victim, your ex-wife, has suffered and still continues to suffer. Yes, ma'am. And, and will continue to suffer. We also hear from your other victim, who is your mother, who's also suffering as a result of your actions. You realize that. Oh. Yes, sir. I mean, yes, but but I, I listen very carefully to Mr. Swear. Uh, and, and he knows you better than anybody. Um, I, the record is the record. Um, but what he says carries great weight with me. Um, my vote today, based on the hard work that you've done, uh, I too believe you're not the same person who committed this horrible act. I think you've reckoned with your, um, um, the way you were brought up, as you put it. Uh, my vote today would be to commute your sentence to make you parole eligible after having served. 15 years. So uh, you've received one vote to deny based on the opposition and the other factors that were mentioned. You've received four votes to commute your sentence. So we will make the recommendation that your sentence be commuted after yes, serving 15 and that you be parole eligible after serving 15 years. It doesn't change your term of your sentence. Right. It just gives you parole eligibility. Uh, yes, and I would like to ask before we before we adjourn, I'd like to ask Miss Angelia if you would just stand by after I adjourn. Our staff is going to put you in another little Zoom room so we can speak to you. Okay. All right. So that concludes our business. Now concludes our business, Mr. Swear at State Police yes, Barracks. We'll we'll adjourn at twelve fifty five p.m. Thanks so much for accommodating us. Very good. Thank stand you. Stand by, Miss. Thank you. Ms. Poulard, stand by. I'm just glad that Jim Wise is no longer a part of the parole board. I mean, his interview was so just lacking. And no, he's not related at all with, with Ms. Uh, Ms. Wise. It was like you had no idea how terrible this crime was until Mr. O'Shea jumps in. And, you know, because he took a plea deal, this is all we are able to find. And uh, man sentenced to 20 years for attempted red rum. He was 37 years old at the time, or he's 37 years old, and uh, he lit his wife on fire. And now he will spend 20 years in jail. He admitted to dousing her with gasoline, setting her on fire. He pled guilty to second degree attempted 
um, and will not have the possibility of the parole. This is not the first case that we have had for for uh, a man lighting a woman on fire. The most viewed YouTube um, hearing that we have is a similar case. And he was given life, not 20 years. Um, and the survivor of that has left a big impact on many of us. She actually commented on the hearing. And uh, one of the most amazing women we have seen if, um, on, uh, on these parole boards uh, hearings, actually, in my opinion. Um, here it is. Let me just pull it up so you can see it in all, all, uh, I will as well, I will link to it at the end. Um, so you can, you can watch it if you haven't already, if you haven't already seen it. And here you can see uh, Miss Thelma Batista, 3,400 likes her comments. She wrote, thank you for the comments and prayers. My faith, my family, my friends help me get through this. And there are 500 replies. If you want to leave a comment for her, um, I'll leave the link in the, in the description. But this is part of what drives me to continue doing this. It was very early on when I first posted her hearing and she wrote me an email. She wrote in the comments and that was she, I think her, her response in the way that she uh, acted in her hearing and then engaged me about it and the way the community engaged her I think was was probably the kickoff point for me. I haven't really thought about that until now. I don't know. So he, he received a 20 year sentence. This hearing took place in 2020, uh, almost November. So about two years ago, he was in locked up for what? 10 years at the time of that hearing. A little over 10 years. Now, the commutation that he got, the governor has to sign off on it. And then he has a parole hearing and it's only going to release him, give him the opportunity to get released five years early if the governor signs it. As far as we know, the governor has not signed it. We have not had his parole hearing or, or I would have played it for you. And there's a chance he can get denied the parole. Uh, I am shocked that the board commuted it. He was given a 20-year deal. It, he tried to light his wife on fire. It was attempted red rum. I use those words for the U YouTube thing. So I'm not bringing light to the situation. Why would you give off? It's not like he's in there for life and you're looking to commute his sentence and he served 50 years. And he's basically spent most of his time at the police barracks. It's like, you know, it's, 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 I don't know if it's the highest status level of trustee because we, there are people that can work that, 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 um, our work release. There are people who, who literally babysit the governor's kids, um, if you, it's in so many words. Uh, but live at the governor's mansion. Like I, I the, this, the, the police barracks is a very high level. You can't do anything wrong. We saw someone get kicked out of the police barracks because someone uh, gave him $5 and he kept the $5 cash. I mean, there's, they, they, they don't take any infraction lightly, but the, the, again, I, I, what merit, I mean, Miss, Miss, Mr. Roche said it best. I mean, his wife comes up here and 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 preaches to the parole board, and Miss Renata basically shows very little, I think, you know, awareness or appreciation. It's more like, yes, we understand that things are tough. Basically, it's like I don't know. And 
let him serve out his full sentence. I mean, again, he's he's still locked up. They commuted it where he would have the opportunity for parole, and it's possible he won't get the parole. But you're putting the victim through the now where she has to show up again if he would get parole, and then have to show up every you know maybe two years even if he gets denied. So you are, and and it's like he tried to let you on fire. <laughs> it's such a vicious, vicious crime. And he showed up to the parole board lying. He didn't take accountability. He blamed her. He started saying to Mr. O'Shea, I came there with the fuel tank to light the house because she said he was, she was going to take my stuff. And she came over and grabbed it. What? You're going to allow him to now say to, to stick with that belief and will reward him? I don't understand. Some of these hearings just blow my mind. It's like trying to put yourself in that space. You take a can of gasoline and you move it and you pour it on your wife and you light a match. And she is lit on fire. You get just 20 years. You show up to a hearing and you say that basically talking about how it was her fault. It wasn't, you didn't do it on purpose. If she didn't walk up to grab it, you wouldn't have. And then you you reward him with a with a recommendation to the governor to shorten his sentence from an already short sentence of twenty years. Why? But you wouldn't believe it probably if you didn't see it, and that's why we do this. You know, this this is where it's important that the DA shows up, that the assistant DA shows up and represents his or her constituency, the people that really are voting them into office and say, you know what? No, let me go through the facts of this case. Maybe you don't have it. This is what happened. You know, did he call the police right after he did it or did he run away? I mean, there are details that are important. No, it's okay. He's a change guy. Anyways, with that, I'll let you go.